do a kickoff real quick mm -hmm. and get it moving and uh, let's see what we can do together today. So Christine, if you don't mind, if you'll pull up the, the slide deck for us. <gasps> There's Steve Ashpole, who invited you? <laughs> Hello, my friends. Aloha. So, hi. Oh, we lost the slide deck there. Christina, shall we give it another whirl? Awesome, thank you. So uh, if all of you are here for an overview of these wonderful new investments in our equity efforts for our community tech colleges in the form of uh, Senate Bill 5227 and 5194, you're in the right place. We've got a lot of content and material to share with you, including a college showcase or college colleges showcases. Um, really glad for those college teams who are joining us today to highlight some of the work that they're doing that is part of um, their implementation of these bills. So hopefully uh, you're able to glean some good information, some uh, starting points if you haven't already started on some of this work on your campus. Uh, many of our campuses, campuses are already out of the gate. So uh, welcome, glad to have you. And we will just go ahead and get to the next deck, I think. I think it's Christina, yeah. Do you mind advancing that? Perfect, so you'll see here right in front of you uh, is uh, the newly dedicated first time ever uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion team with the state board. So we're, we're excited and thrilled uh, to be able to come together and support the good work that your colleges are already doing as well as continuing to turn the mirror on ourselves within our own agency, and then stay in lockstep with the overall state efforts through the uh, state, uh, Washington State's Office of Equity. So our work is uh, two-pronged, it's internal and external focus, um, but across those three areas. And so a lot of the work today focuses on that system support for our community tech colleges. So um, thank you for being here with us. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce myself really briefly, and I'm gonna do it in a, uh, what we're, we're calling it, a non-institutional manner. Thanks to Melissa Williams who introduced that to us today at our um, all staff meeting at the agency. And that's a way to introduce ourselves uh, in a way that centers ourselves as, as people, uh, as opposed to just employees. Uh, so I'll do sort of a hybrid of that. Um, so I'm Ha Wen, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have uh, the absolute honor of serving as the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion with the State Board, which I always lovingly refer to as the mothership of the 34 colleges across <laughs> our dear system. Um, <clears throat> I am living and working from the ancestral lands of uh, the Coast Salish and Puyallup tribes. Um, I was also born in Saigon. My family fled our homeland in April of 1975 after the fall of Saigon and the collapse of the uh, South Vietnamese government. So we were uh, one of the families they came across on that first wave of boat people. And we made it to Camp Pendleton, California, where we were um, sponsored by families in Washington state. So that's how my family ended up here. I also have a lifetime opportunity of raising two beautiful daughters who could not be more different than each other. <laughs> so when I uh, come to parenting one daughter and thinking those strategies and approaches will work for the other one, I'm dead wrong. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. I'll pass it off to Melissa to introduce herself. Thank you. It always makes me laugh when you talk about your daughters being so different. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, I, my name is Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her, uh, and I am the policy associate uh, in the equity, diversity, and inclusion department working with Ha and Christina. And um, before that, we're uh, working at Clark College. Uh, I live and work in Vancouver, Washington, which is on the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz and the Chinook. Uh, and my, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. My, um, my mom's side of the family uh, were uh, white engineers and teachers from the East Coast. My dad's side of the family uh, were in, formerly enslaved and uh, formerly enslaved people and sharecroppers in the state of Texas. Um, and I am a historian by education. My, my bachelor's and master's degrees are both in U.S. history. 
Uh, I concentrate on black history and I research black history in uh, the Vancouver, Washington area. And I do a lot of community work around that, lots of presentations and speaking engagements sharing that history uh, in Southwest Washington. So I'll pass it to Christina. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, my name is Christina Pleasance. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the administrative assistant for the equity, diversity and inclusion team. I'm very excited to be in this work with Ha and Melissa and uh, the whole agency. Um, I have learned a lot in this work and look forward to doing more good work. Uh, the non-institutional intro I guess I would give is uh, that I'm a first generation Asian American citizen and a first generation university graduate uh, as being born with by a single born and raised by a single father in Washington state, I have seen the changes and growth in its communities and am positively influenced by the people within it. Um, my passion is the constructive development of our future generations in a progressive society. I hope that the work that we're doing is uh, a hopefully in part of that. So thanks so much. I'm going to progress on to the next slide where I will thank you for joining us. And um, we ask, that you share your name, title, and college in the chat. I can put mine in there as well, just so we know where you're coming from. And if you would like to put in a non-institutional introduction as well, something about yourself that is not reflected within your um, profession, feel free to do so. And as we are trying to be as accessible as possible, uh, we ask that um, you please be courteous to others and speak clearly and slowly. Live auto transcription will be provided through Zoom and the presentation will be recorded and include a full transcription, which will then be accessible on our new EDI webpage, which I will also drop in the chat. And please see our accessibility statement here. SVCTC is committed to providing equal access for individuals with disabilities to its programs and events in accordance with the ADA and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. If you need, a, if you have any questions, please use the um, documents, uh, questions document for the or the questions you might have throughout the presentation. I'll drop that in the chat. And if you have any um, technical questions or any general questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to help you. Okay, and let's go on to Melissa. Thank you, Christina. I am going to read our land acknowledgement and our labor acknowledgement so we can ground ourselves uh, today. Um, please feel free as I'm reading the acknowledgement to share in the chat box if you'd like uh, the ancestral lands that you occupy, uh, either maybe where you grew up or where you work or where you're currently living, please feel free to share. Um, SBCTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin peoples. We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. We know that such statements only become truly meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. And as such, we commit to continued efforts to build our collective understanding and action to foster authentic native community connections. Uh, so it's always a good time to pause and reflect on how we have done that work, how we have um, formed those connections, how we've educated ourselves about uh, our indigenous family and friends, brothers, sisters, siblings, um, and the work that still must be done uh, in order to honor and celebrate um, the original inhabitants of the places we enjoy. So thank you. And then I will read the labor acknowledgement as well. The 
labor acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and of those who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora, honor the contributions, talents, and dreams of our black communities. We acknowledge the immigrant labor that has contributed to the nation as a critical labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their significant contributions. In these acknowledgments, we commit to the essential work of moving beyond awareness to action through meaningful changes at our institutions and in our communities. Uh, so similarly, we want to give specific recognition to folks who have built this nation, uh, many different people, many different walks of life and coming to us from many different places uh, and having vastly different experiences often, um, but being able to acknowledge and celebrate that. So thank you. So moving to the purpose, our intended purpose today with this session, uh, we have identified three key purposes and those are um, to highlight for, for the state board to highlight uh, the work of diversity and equity officers um, in our state and the significance to equity, diversity and inclusion work um, that they do. And so we are elevating the voices of our key diversity officers um, at the colleges who are who give everything, everything to this work and who ought to be um, the table kind of that we're working around. Instead of inviting them to the table, we ought to be at their table um, so that we can call on that expertise, that wisdom, that cultural knowledge uh, and all of the um, experience that they bring to this work. So we are dedicated to lifting those voices and really um, highlighting the work that they're doing. Uh, and so that is something that we are passionate about. Our other purpose, uh, we want to, of course, uh, cover the significance of the state bills uh, 5194 and 5227 that we're going to uh, provide overviews for today uh, to advance the work of equity, diversity, and inclusion in our institutions. And so we will provide some um, information for you today, and you'll get to hear from the colleges, as Ha mentioned, um, so that you have an idea of some of the work that is being done in, uh, in the spirit of these bills. Uh, and then lastly, we um, want to highlight the actions of our colleges. We want you to be able to uh, recognize some good models, maybe in other institutions and uh, to make connections with peers across the state uh, who can you know, guide you, answer questions, uh, give you support, um, and just to be able to network and make good connections that way. Yes, Melissa, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate how you amplify um, the aspect of elevating the, the talent and the expertise of our diversity and equity officers, many of whom I see in the room today. Um, so absolutely, we are very much um, emphasizing that as we communicate and uh, some support and guidance <clears throat> for this work, um, in particular around these legislative bills. Um, and to emphasize the importance of doing that on your own campus as well. And so hopefully we're modeling that for, for our colleagues across the system uh, to follow suit. Okay, so just a quick uh, overview. You'll see in front of you, I'm gonna give a, a brief overview and update on Se uh, Senate Bill 5227 and 5194. Just a recap, um, two bills that shine a light on the importance of cultivating campus spaces where our students, uh, particularly our students of color, and minoritized students uh, feel a sense of belonging, <coughs> excuse me, and support for their success. And the bills also posit that our faculty, staff, and administrators play a key role in creating this environment. Um, thanks always to the good work of many of the colleges in the Zoom room today who stepped into the fire with us in this last legislative session and provided testimony for critical components of these bills uh, and helping legislators to perfect them even further. So uh, a big nod to our uh, diversity and equity officers, Dr. Rashida Willard, Parfait Basile, who's here with us today. He's gonna be sharing about South Puget Sound's uh, work in regards to uh, peer mentoring strategies and outreach to communities of color. Uh, Robert Britton from Lake Washington, uh, uh, Lake Washington and Dr. Valerie Hunt from Seattle Central. 
Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't include Dr. Sayuma Ari from South Seattle. And then there were a number of presidents and trustees that stepped in to testify too, including uh, Dr. Rosie Romando Sharonso from South Seattle, uh, Dr. Ivan Harrell from Tacoma, uh, Dr. Timothy Stokes from South Puget, Dr. John Mosby from Highline, um, and Doug Ma, a trustee from South Puget Sound Community Colleges. So lots of folks came together to ensure the passage uh, of these bills in the last session um, and to really inform the historic investments that came with them. I uh, would also like to take just a second to acknowledge that there's been prior to this happening a whole host of equity efforts across our system for a good number of number of years. Many of you in this room have either led or been involved in those efforts. Uh, we're incredibly grateful for these new investments to further advance and scale that work in any way. Uh, so working to intentionalize some of that work and honor some of that work that's been done in, in many capacities across many colleges. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully the appropriations in this way will help to support those efforts as well. And again, another nod to the diversity and equity officers group uh, made up again of our executive level equity officers um, and the president's equity committee, which emerged in the last couple of years, as well as the trustees equity committee. Um, and then of course the other grassroots groups uh, really to consider how to support the colleges in implementing the requirements of these two diversity bills. Um, that will require, um, as we'll recap, uh, the emergence of diversity plans, hiring strategies, considerations of campus climate surveys, and then of course outreach into um, our communities of color. Uh, so before I sort of kick into this, I wanna make sure, I think that Christina dropped into the chat, the Google Doc for questions. Um, so we're trying to maintain as much time as possible for the college showcases and uh, content sharing. And if there's questions you might have, please feel free to pop them into that Google Doc and we'll be responding to those um, and uh, sending out to everybody as well. Okay, so 5227 you see in front of you, the, you know, there's an overall uh, deliverable on this. The overarching deliverable is the DEI strategic plans. And this is found in section three. Um, of 5194. This is 5194 was uh, what we sort of referred to over session as the kitchen sink bill. It's very complex and complex and complicated. It's got a number of different areas embedded within it. Uh, for purposes of today, we focus on uh, section three of that, and that is the uh, deliverable of the DEI strategic plan. Um, and under that deliverable are three key items uh, that colleges will be tasked to uh, ensure implementation on. And you'll see uh, boldly in front of you there, the campus climate assessments, conducting listening and feedback sessions and or what we've begun to refer to them as engagement sessions and professional development training in DEI and anti-racism. Uh, so those are the items that will be required to be included within those strategic plans. Now, <clears throat> that's not to say that that uh, the DEI strategic plan shouldn't only minimally include that. I would consider reaching across to um, 5227 as well. Um, as uh, I'm sorry, 5194. Oh gosh, you know what? I think I'm looking at two different screens and providing confusing information. I'm sorry, it's 5227 that we're look that you're looking at. Correct on your screen. Yes. Okay, I apologize. I think I'm looking at a different screen uh, and reading. We can switch page. them around if you want, huh? Nope, that's okay. Back to 5227 um, for the campus climate assessment. Sorry, the overarching <clears throat> areas are those uh, key components. Um, I take I take it all back on 5194. It's not DEI strategic plan, so forgive me on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll see in front of you those three key components. Um, and those are the items that we'll be talking a little bit further on and helping to support uh, colleges uh, in response to what, it, what are some uh, survey uh, tools that they might consider uh, utilizing and um, conducting on their campuses. These are assessments that uh, the language of the bill requires every five years at minimum. That doesn't mean that uh, that's the only time you uh, college can decide to conduct these assessments. So uh, if college would like to, they can get conducted every year if they'd like. Uh, but the requirements of, of the bill only require a five-year minimum. 
Um, and then in between those campus climate assessments that are conducted annually um, with, on the years that they're not conducted, listening and feedback sessions would then be uh, conducted across the campus community, inclusive of faculty, staff, uh, and students. And then lastly, again, the professional development and training um, scaled across uh, in various uh, levels. Uh, the first level, if you'll refer to the Excel sheet within the shared Google Drive, there is a uh, breakdown of the uh, deliverables, the timeline, and the allocations for each of these items uh, explicitly within that Excel sheet. So if you have any questions on that, we won't dig into that today, but if you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out to our team um, at any time in regards to any of the questions around the fiscal allocations, when colleges uh, would expect to receive them, have received them, so on and so forth. So that's 5227. I'm going to go to the next, and this is the kitchen sink, Bill. I apologize, I was working off two different screens, so sorry for the confusion. Uh, so 5194 uh, is the complex bill, uh, and for purposes of today, we're just focusing on section three, which is that overarching DEI uh, strategic plan. So colleges must create DEI strategic plans using an inclusive process um, that includes staff, faculty, uh, students, and administrators. Um, <clears throat> with that, um, if I'm working at a college uh, and the items on 5227 and you're tasked to create a DEI strategic plan for 5194, um, I would consider incorporating all of those items within that plan if possible um, and uh, operationalizing from that point. Um, if that makes sense on your campus, to do that. Um, some colleges have reached out and inquired about their overall campus plans, strategic plans, and if that is sufficient to meet the requirements of this section of 5194. Um, I would say yes, as long as the plan includes these mm -hmm. items within it. Um, if not, other colleges have chosen to go a different route and establish uh, a standalone equity plan that is uh, intentionally specific to these items. So if that's, uh, if that's helpful at all, um, it could be very well that some of the colleges are at stages of their overall college strategic planning processes where they can include this quite readily. Um, and then there are also colleges who have been doing this work for a good long time, who have been already incorporating peer mentoring strategies within that plan or any kind of outreach program to communities of color um, and so on or have done some um, robust work around diversifying uh, faculty and have developed programs on their own campus around that already. And if that's the case, then, then yes, their current DEI strategic plan uh, or their college plan would, would uh, meet um, the, the requirements of the DEI strategic plan. Let's see if I'm missing anything. So an overarching deliverable there, you'll see the student outreach program, uh, peer mentoring strategies, a faculty diversity program, um, and then of course, inclusive of any DEI definitions that are included both on your website, as well as within any kind of reports or within the overall strategic plan. Uh, State Board is tasked to help support the development of a faculty diversity program. We'll talk a little bit to that today as we move forward into some of the showcasing. You would have also found a guidance document, if you will, uh, in the shared Google Drive uh, for this event, specifically around the faculty diversity program. Okay, so implementation timeline. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, Christine, I'm tracking you, I swear. Okay, apologies, everybody. It's, it's my triple Monday. Um, because it is Wednesday, yes. Okay, so for 5194, there's another section <clears throat> in this bill that we want to point to as well. Um, I know that this has gotten a lot of conversations going some, um, on our campuses in regards to the hiring of faculty. Uh, so this is the section that was pretty explicit about hiring full-time tenured positions across the board, uh, 200 new full-time tenured positions. And there was an allocation model 
uh, that was created and supported by our um, Business Affairs Commission group, as well as voted out through the President's group um, on how to divide that allocation of the 5.4 million across the system. Um, and that was approved to be distributed based on two uh, different metrics. 50% was based on share of faculty FTE, and then the remaining 50% based on historically underrepresented students of color. And this is for state funded uh, FTEs. And the overall intent of um, this section and of 5194 is to diversify college faculty in order to improve outcomes for historically underrepresented students of color. So keeping in mind when implementing these conversions um, that there's a specific intent that was written into the uh, from the legislature to have those conversions align with the college's um, strategic plans um, in section three. So again, overall intent was to diversify college faculty. I know a number of colleges have already gotten out of the gate on this piece. Uh, Pierce College is one. I know they're doing uh, some cluster hires uh, of faculty of color. Um, I think some other colleges have already begun advertising um, and starting their hiring processes. And if there's any way that um, our guidance document on the faculty diversity program um, is helpful in any way, there's also a guidance document that went out about a month and a half ago uh, to inform the conversion piece that came from Troy Holiday uh, to each of the colleges too. Um, that's also included in the Google Drive uh, shared doc as well. Okay. And this is just a simple uh, quick peek at an implementation timeline. Uh, so colleges can get a sense of what's due when <laughs> uh, and what do I have to think about sequentially in doing next. And this is not a perfect timeline. Um, for the most part, it's, it's um, operating on the assumption that colleges haven't conducted campus climate assessments at all yet. Uh, so if you are one of those, um, or if you're one that's considering uh, starting anew uh, with conducting a, a new campus climate assessment, or have done it annually anyway, um, academic year 21-22 there, you'd be starting this year to consider the selection of and the implementation and conducting that uh, campus-wide. Uh, and remembering to publish those results um, you're, this also runs in tandem with the submission of the DEI strategic plans. Um, and so the, the language of the bill, we've talked, um, we've had some good questions around this summer, we'll speak to it as well, um, around the language of the bill um, that it states beginning July 30th for those DEI strategic plans to be submitted and then beginning uh, July 1 for the uh, campus climate assessment to, to submit uh, findings and or progress reports to the state board. Uh, so technically colleges, if you're still in a place of thinking about which to select as a, as a tool, as a survey tool, you do have some time. Um, however, our suggestion I think is to consider running those tandem that one informs the other. So if you're thinking about the submission of your DEI strategic plan by the July 30th date, um, to, to conduct your campus climate assessments such that you're able to utilize those progress findings um, to inform your DEI strategic plan. Um, and then if you see across the board, I'll call attention to academic year 22-23, second block down, that's when it begins the requirement for providing anti-racist training. Um, and this is uh, to, to start is for all new faculty only. Uh, with an end goal though of 80% of total faculty and staff to complete every two years. Uh, so just keeping that in mind, that's when the training begins. So that would be next fall uh, for all new, uh, keeping in mind that the overall goal is 80% within the next two years. Um, and then it builds from that and it begins to scale. So you'll see in the subsequent years, the training again for all new, uh, but then it, it becomes inclusive across uh, larger populations. And then by academic year 24, 25, uh, colleges are then asked to uh, provide training for all degree seeking students. So now it becomes inclusive of uh, the student population. Okay, I think that 
move to the next to questions. Oh, not questions, I'm sorry, to guidance. So I'm going to hand this off now to Summer Kennison, who is the interim research director at the state board uh, with us. And she's done some incredible work uh, helping to lead this effort um, very collaboratively and centering um, the intellect and expertise of the uh, diversity and equity officers as well. So I really wanna give her some, um, some big props for that. Uh, there's also the faculty diversity uh, model template, which we'll point to really quickly as well. Um, doing tandem work with our HR department with Julie Huss there at the helm. Um, we'll be showcasing uh, a DEI anti-racism professional development with uh, Sherry Davenport and Samantha Brown from Cascadia. Um, the outreach and peer mentoring uh, strategies, as I mentioned, by Parfait Basley of South Puget Sound Community College, and then the uh, DEI strategic plans with uh, Jeanette Quintero and her team from Yakima Valley College. I will go ahead and hand that off to you, Summer. Great, um, thank you. Um, Christine, if you could just skip ahead one that's um, over you. Um, Claude's pretty much already covered that. Uh, so what I want to do today is just kind of give you a quick rundown on the guidance that's available around the campus climate assessments under 5227. Uh, as Ha mentioned, it's really important. We're encouraging institutions to try and get campus climate assessments completed uh, early enough that they can inform the uh, strategic plan. Um, the guidance document uh, that we have for the campus climate assessments and some aspects of the um, engagement sessions is available in the Google Drive. So you can have a look at that. Um, this guidance document was not prepared in isolation. Um, ha and I worked very closely on this. Uh, we had several consultation sessions um, to inform the development. Um, those included students uh, of color, uh, faculty and administrators of color, um, a subgroup of the DEOC, and a subgroup, the DEI subgroup of the Research and Planning Commission. So that all of that kind of went in to make sure that uh, we have a combination here of logistical expertise that comes from the Research and Planning Commission side, but most importantly, we have the subject matter expertise that comes from the DOC, and we have the input of students, faculty, and administrators around what's worked in the past and, and what really needs to change for this to be effective for the future. Okay, next slide. So within that document, you'll see most of this um, kind of fleshed out a little bit more, but here are some of the essential overarching principles that we landed on. Um, first of all, that campus climate assessments should be inclusive. That means that they should be selected and administered to a broad college consultation. This is actually defined within the bill that a campus climate assessment, whether a college designs their own, uses an existing instrument or selects something new, must be done through a consultation process with students, faculty, and diversity and equity officers. So even if you have something that you've used in the past and you want to keep using it, you still need to make sure that you have a new document that process. I would also say that it's important when you look at those consultation groups that you ensure that those consultation groups are also diverse. So for example, you're working through, to your students, to your student government, ensure that that collective um, represents a diverse population. Um, that they should be administered to meet the needs of all students, faculty, and staff as far as possible. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that, um, but that relates to accessibility, language, technology, and a number of other factors. But they should be transparent. The CCAs need to be administered and the results analyzed and published with integrity and openness. Part of this will also come down to how you publish and work with your results, but we think it's very important and the guidance is very clear about how the communication also needs to be inclusive so that everyone knows that it's available, has the opportunity to participate, but then also can see what's happening with the results, how they're being um, handled and analyzed, and what those outcomes are. That they need to be impactful. The findings from the campus climate assessments need to be used to inform the DEI strategic plans and professional development programs, but also even wider, they should need to be a meaningful part of your overall college improvement plans. Okay, next. Okay, so the, the outcomes of the 5227 campus climate assessments, as they're defined in the bill, um, are, are fairly precise. 
and these are really kind of a minimum uh, expectation on what the, the impact of the campus climate assessments and the listening sessions, the engagement sessions should be. First of all, the colleges must publish annually on their website the results of either the campus climate assessment or the engagement sessions, or both, if you have both in a year. Um, that the findings from the campus climate assessments inform the DEI strategic plan and the professional development. And that colleges maximize their transparency through open communication with students, faculty, and staff on the assessment selection design, the implementation, the analysis, and the findings. At the end of 2024, the State Board will prepare a report to the legislature that looks at a summary of the completed campus climate assessments. Um, but that's, that's the extent of the evaluation that is mandated for the State Board on the bill. Um, however, again, this is kind of a, a, a minimum uh, minimum piece. The focus here really needs to be on um, colleges ensuring that they publish those findings uh, and they publish those findings transparently and in full. Again, we strongly recommend that colleges complete the CCAs before July 1st so that they can inform their strategic plan. However, we do recognize that some of the instruments that colleges use might be have restricted calendars if they're using commercial proprietary tool, uh, that they might want to use fall quarter. Um, students um, because that's a, a population that works best with some of their other systems that you might already have a calendar that you're working with. Um, so while we, we really, really would suggest that getting into your campus climate assessments completed by July 1st is going to be really um, significant in terms of how they inform your DS strategic plan. Um, we, we do want to say that, that there are options here to be, to be flexible if that is in the most appropriate way for your college to go forward. Okay, next. Now, the State Board is not um, preparing or mandating any specific campus climate instrument. Um, this is really because if we design something, um, we would remove the flexibility of colleges to be able to respond to the specific needs of where they are in their journey uh, and what's most appropriate for what they understand to be the needs of their students, staff, and faculty. So what we have done in the guidance document is we have an evolving list of suggested existing CCAs that are out there um, that the state board feels meet the requirements and expectations of the bill. Um, again, these are not a commercial recommendation of any particular tool. Uh, there are some in the guidance document for students specifically, some for faculty and staff, and some that meet the needs of both. Most of these instruments uh, will be familiar because there's already colleges in the system using each of those. Um, where those instruments are adding in, um, specific uh, questions or um, subscales or additional sections around uh, diversity and equity, um, and we expect that to be included, that's also included in the list. Again, note the requirement to consult with faculty, students, and DEI officers, even if you're using an existing instrument. If you use something off that list and want to continue to use it, that does not negate this responsibility. The state board could require colleges to repeat their campus climate assessments um, if we do not feel that they have been um, selected or administered or analyzed uh, with, within the spirit of the bill. Uh, so we encourage if you have any concerns about that, so please reach out to Ha or myself and we can talk you through that. We've already had some colleges contacting us um, to get some guidance and some support and we're more than happy to help you there. Okay, next. Um, here's just a quick rundown if you are thinking about what you want to do in terms of, of what type of campus climate assessment you want to use. Uh, like I say, most of the instruments that are in our list um, are, are commercial and proprietary. Um, they do have the very significant benefit of being impartial in that the college itself does not handle any of the direct data. And this was brought out in the feedback sessions as perhaps being very significant and encouraging full and open participation um, in that. There, the data is collected, the data is handled, their data is kept confidential, and the results are handled independently and then returned back to the college. Uh, they can be very efficient. Um, they have extraordinary resources behind them, uh, professionally developed questions. Um, most of these instruments have been through a centralized institutional review board. So if you have concerns about that in your institution, that may already be met with some of these. Uh, it also enables you to do, in, with some of them, some national benchmarking or comparisons. However, there is a cost, although for some of these instruments, there may be economies of scale if colleges want to go into consortium. I'll talk about that in a second. 
Uh, but again, you, you'll be fairly limited in the controls over the questions that you have, and in some cases, the timing, although most of these also allow for at least some custom questions. Uh, and then you'll be restricted because you don't have the, the data yourself and what you can do in terms of the um, detail and the breakdowns and the analysis. However, again, most of these uh, agencies will offer um, additional breakdowns and analysis if you specifically request them. In-house instruments um, allow you to design them yourself, have real complete control over the questions and the content, uh, and you can adapt them to meet any particular student needs that you have. For example, if you have large populations of students um, with um, other languages, these make it easier for you to actually translate and, and communicate uh, your um, the questions in the most appropriate original language. However, the disadvantages of this are well, the, primarily the, the consistently raised concern about transparency and impartiality. Uh, you may have an in-house IRB process that can be very time consuming. Uh, there is a cost. When looking at the cost of commercial instruments, also weigh that against the cost of actually designing, developing, and implementing and administering something in-house. Um, and as well as the with that data set, the extra time that it will take to analyze those results. You also then will be responsible for the security and the confidentiality of, of the raw data that you collect. So this may be dependent on what resources you have in your institution. You may already have a tool that you want to develop and enhance to the consultation. You may already have the expertise. That's great. Um, there's no reason for a college is not to use an in-house tool. Uh, but the, for those that, that want to go with something already prepared, for the reasons listed here, the current listed examples that are um, that, that, that the state board uh, feels meet the terms of the bill are in that guidance document. Okay, next. Um, if you do want to work either with an in-house uh, tool or a commercial tool, and you want to work in consortium with other colleges, uh, there's been some um, suggestion here. There are some um, of these uh, tool producers that have already reached out so that they would consider uh, group pricing, which might make things more economical. Or if you want to think about doing a peer group comparison or benchmarking, then you might want to get together with some of the other colleges um, in, in your peer group or with those categories that you want to compare and consider uh, a consortium model. However, the, the administering a CCA as a consortium does not negate any of the in college's individual responsibility. So your college must still meet those requirements to consult with your own faculty, students, DEI officers, and staff on the selection of that instrument. Um, you must publish and submit findings that reflect the outcomes from your own college. Uh, and if you choose to also publish collectives, that's fine, but you still have to publish your own. Um, and, and like I said, this may work well for some institutions. Um, there are some uh, of the tools and of the PACE survey, for example, for faculty, a lot of colleges are already using that. Um, they've produced a new uh, DEI subscale, and that's one agency that we know has already reached out to a few colleges uh, to look at the possibility of uh, some shared contract pricing. Okay, next. Okay, finally, just to kind of reiterate the, some of the significant components that came back to us in the feedback sessions around inclusion, accessibility, and support. Um, first of all, to ensure that all students and employees are appropriately informed in a timely manner on the administration of the CCA and how to participate. Um, being able to ensure that your communication strategies, particularly if you have a lot of remote learners or you're still in a very remote environment, um, you have students that speak um, other languages, uh, students might have limited technology, that even when you're thinking about that in terms of the administration, you need to think about that in terms of the communication as well. And this goes not just for the CCA, but also for the uh, engagement session. And make sure that the administration of the campus climate assessment does not include any students because of accessibility technology or other support issues. Um, if you have concerns about that, we do have resources at the state board. Monica Olson uh, is at the state board um, and she is our leader on accessibility and she's more than happy to work with colleges to ensure that their communication and their administration um, is fully inclusive. Ensure that participation of students under age 18, other than emancipated minors, includes appropriate parental consent. Again, there are a lot of colleges that have large populations of running start or dual enrolled students that might fall into this category. Many of the proprietary tools will pull those students out of the data for you, uh, but it's something to think about um, and to have that conversation at your college. 
ensure that adequate services are available for participants that experience trauma or distress from participating in the campus climate assessment. The process of completing the campus climate assessment um, and reflecting on a personal experience um, and conditions, um, the journey that a student has on a particular campus can be very traumatic. Uh, and it's essential that before students partake in these uh, campus climate assessments, that you know that you have the necessary support services available and that you communicate that out to your students. So they know where to go if they find that in the process of completing the campus climate assessment, um, they feel that they have uncovered, relived uh, trauma and they need support with that. And then finally, um, and, and this one is one that, that was really interesting to us, um, came back particularly from students about communicating and administering the campus climate assessment in multiple languages if that's appropriate for your student, staff, or faculty population. And what's important here around the administration piece is it isn't just about translating the survey appropriately into other languages, it's also about um, having um, native speakers of those languages help with the analysis because there may be cultural factors that come out in the translation that would be missed if you're working strictly with a translation or a translation tool. It's important to make sure here that you bring in those cultural components. So that's that's it for me. Um, the survey tools, as you can see here, they're all included in the guidance document. That is an evolving document. Um, as we have more and more experience, we'll be seeing that kind of enhanced um, and expanded. Uh, the Research and Planning Commission is also developing a resource bank uh, that will include um, details of the experiences of administering some of these tools or some of their in-house pieces, some common questions that people might want to use. Um, and experiences of costing, contracting, those, those sorts of pieces. Um, and that's when that's available for publication, that'll be added into the Google Drive here as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm listening in feedback session. Sorry, listening in feedback yeah. session. Um, that, that piece is still very much evolving. There are a lot of complicated questions here about the resources involved in this, um, the expectations, um, how to manage that confidence and participation on campuses, and the compensation piece. And we're currently looking into that, uh, and that'll be evolving and um, be adding into the guidance document as we go a little bit further along. Thanks. Great, thanks, Summer. I want to highlight and emphasize again that point you made uh, in regards to the inclusive approach that uh, we took at the system level to gather as much information from our uh, and feedback from our DEO group to center their leadership in that, but also across uh, our faculty and staff of color groups as well. Um, there's a stakeholder feedback document that's included in the Google Drive as well that will provide some rich information and will help to uh, guide your efforts uh, in regards to this. So hopefully that's helpful to you. I wanted to make sure to emphasize that and um, really encourage everybody to um, replicate that approach, not just because it's uh, really a, a wonderful standard of practice, uh, but also because it's written directly into the language of the bill. Uh, so there's that too. Okay, so we just have a, a few minutes on the faculty diversity program. Uh, so State Board is also tasked to help provide as much support and guidance in the development of this. Uh, so if you remember 5194 section three outlined the requirement that all uh, community tech colleges would submit on a biennial basis, those DEI strategic plans. Um, and included in that requirement embedded within that is the development of a model faculty diversity program which should be essentially designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of faculty uh, from all racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds and must be, uh, must be built upon uh, proven practices and diversity hiring processes. Uh, so in keeping with the decentralized nature of our system uh, and the aspect of local control for each of the colleges, uh, our approach uh, is not to, again, mandate a specific program to be created and delivered, but uh, we work to provide a list of resources uh, within that Google Drive doc on the faculty diversity program. Um, and then considerations for colleges uh, to uh, think about as they develop their own diversity program, which they'll embed within the strategic plans. Um, the resource list is solely intended to provide options um, in support of each college's faculty diversity program. There's no requirement for colleges to use any of, of those resources. So again, uh, some of uh, the colleges here 
in the Zoom room may already have a, a well-established, uh, proven, successful faculty diversity model program. So I uh, don't want to impinge on that and mandate anything else if it's successful and already working. Uh, so the faculty diversity model template um, intends to provide uh, colleges a, a blueprint to assist. Um, again, it's a key component in that strategic plan that's required. Um, and it really does give colleges a chance to highlight their current efforts too for diversifying faculty um, and assist really to uh, have you highlight um, where you're doing really well and where those areas and where you can have some growth opportunities <clears throat> in regards to that um, on your campuses. One of the things we also wanted to do is take into account other happenings across uh, the college campus environment that we could loop into and not ask colleges to replicate their efforts. And one of those things that emerged in the last year was a requirement from our Office of Financial Management for uh, Workplace Directive. Oh, help me, Julie. I think it was 2002. Um, all of this is in the Faculty Diversity Program model template uh, that I keep referring to. Uh, but it required all of our colleges, including State Board, to submit a workforce diversity plan. Um, and so that requirement was due uh, last December uh, 2020. Uh, so building on that plan, uh, we took that plan and adapted it for purposes of this uh, section. And so you'll see uh, if you are, uh, essentially if you are a representative of the HR community on your campus, um, the uh, components within our model template will mirror a lot of what was already asked of the colleges to be doing and to uh, have already submitted. Uh, so doing that with the sentiment of not asking colleges to duplicate efforts again, but rather get in alignment with what our overall state requirements have been coming from um, um, the Office of Financial Management. So we hope that that has been helpful uh, as you look through that. I would also encourage again, the collaborative effort um, I mentioned before to signal um, and role model that from our end in uh, our equity team working also with our HR team in regards to this particular item. So I would again encourage colleges to do the same um, and center the HR uh, departments and community on your campuses as well as being incredibly inclusive of your diversity officers should that be a model that your college um, campus um, has in place. I know uh, several colleges may not have that executive level diversity officer. Uh, we're doing our best and always being mindful of that fact um, and uh, ensuring that our team is here to provide as much support to those colleges uh, in the Zoom room today who may not have that DEO officer on your campus. Uh, please know that we're here to uh, support you as much as possible. We are an open door um, and we will uh, do whatever we can to provide information at large and broadly so that it um, lands uh, to you in all the different areas on campuses as well. Uh, Julie, do you have anything to add at all to <clears throat> the faculty diversity program? I don't know, Julie, if she's been quadruple booked lately, so I don't know if she's still here with us. I am. I think that pretty much covers it. I just shared it to um, your HR VPs. Um, so, and we have a call here shortly. So if they have any questions about it, um, I'm sure they'll let me know, but I just shared that out with them as well. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, one last thing, we are working to prepare some possible February events that would highlight uh, support for this particular item. Uh, so stay tuned for some information on that. Uh, again, it will probably follow the same model, a showcase of some of the efforts across our HR communities um, uh, at different colleges, as well as a couple, two or three different uh, hiring models uh, that your college may consider um, as you're building out this item. Uh, so stay tuned and we'll provide some more information on that. Uh, so now I'm going to hand off to uh, Yakima Valley College, uh, Jeanette Quintero, uh, to share their incredible work in the development of their DEI strategic plan. Hi, I'm Jeanette here. Um, I'm gonna straight off the bat just say that I am sick. So if you hear like an awkward silence or I hit mute, it's probably because I had a coughing spell. So I appreciate your patience as I get through this. Um, 
Um, Dr. Ilda Guzman and Steven Sloniker were supposed to join me today. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Ilda Guzman and Steve might be joining us here in a little bit. So I'll get through, you know, through these pieces. If you do have questions, you know, feel free to stop me uh, you know, along the way or whatnot, or <clears throat> feel free to put your questions in that Google Doc as well. <clears throat> and then if you want to move over, yeah, there you go, Christina. Thank you. Um, the first part, I just want to start off with our background. Um, we were asked to go ahead and just provide our thought process and our steps in developing our EDI strategic plan for the college. The first thing I want to say with YBC that for us, the support of executive leadership was very important to get this um, work going. First off, um, about a year ago, I'm going to say um, we had a team that consisted of you know, Dr. Ilda Guzman and a few others on campus that helped develop our college's strategic plan. Um, with that being said, there was a lot of conversations at the executive level of how that work was going to be done, who was going to be doing what. But again, open conversations, that support was there. With that support then came the development of strategic plan work groups. And I apologize if, again, I'm kind of running out of here is coughing. I feel like a cough is coming on. So um, with our strategic plan groups, what happened is in our strategic, if you go to our YBC website um, and you look at our strategic plan, you'll see that we have different directions. Within each of those directions, um, you'll see that all the language we used and our actions that we hope to take here in the near future was de developed through an equity lens. And in order to make now we have the strategic plan, we have this work to do, but now it's not just words. We wanna make sure that the work, what we're saying we're gonna do is actually gonna happen and it's gonna become actionable. In order to do that, we said we need to have work groups because this work is not just solely done by one person, right? <clears throat> and so each, um, each strategic direction took on two co-leads. Um, one of those directions, strategic direction um, three, which focuses on equity, diversion, uh, equity, um, diversity, and social justice. So for us, when these two bills came through, 5194 and 5227, we had to look at both of those components and see where the alignment was. And if you look at our strategic plan, a lot of those components are already within our strategic plan. So we have to um, give thanks again to the team that helped, you know, develop our strategic plan, but not only them, we also had um, equity teams on campus that helped get this work put together. Um, so for example, we had an equity language team that helped develop our revised and new mission statement. Um, we had equity team help us develop our DEI, strategic, our DEI um, uh, terms that we're gonna be publishing on the site and then aligning with our EDI strategic plan. Um, we have a team with, with regards to hiring and recruitment, um, which was you know, focused on faculty and staff. And so they helped, you know, implement some of those pieces and start that process. <clears throat> and then, um, and so again, you know, I want to say, you know, thank you. Um, one of the members who's actually not with YBC anymore is uh, Maribel Jimenez, who's over at Highline. And she, I want to say thank you to her. I'm not sure if she's here today, but she was at the last session. She was a valuable member to the team that helped, you know, some of that, get some of that work going. So once we had the bills presented to us, um, 5194 and 5227. Um, again, we go back to the support of executive leadership. We presented what this information meant. We had to analyze what it meant. We had to um, align it with our strategic plan. Once we were ready, we presented this information to our to the campus at a convocation to say, hey, this is the work that's coming through. These are the bills. This is the information. And let them know that, you know, we were going to be working on figure, you know, putting together a work plan to make sure that this work was getting accomplished. And again, we highly emphasize that, you know, this is not the just the job of Jeanette or one sole person, but, um, you know, responsibility of the whole campus community. And so that's kind of the background on how we got started there. So Christina, if you wanna <clears throat> move on to the next slide. Um, and then the way, once these bills came into play, um, Ilda and myself, because we're both the co-leads to the strategic um, direction number three, which focuses on equity and social justice. Um, we took, a, again, took a look at the bills, the components of these bills, and we started putting together a work plan. 
Um, we started, you know, I contacted Ha, I looked at all the information that came from the state board, joining the DOC, absorbing all that information. And we said, hey, <clears throat> so again, we know that some of these components are in strategic direction. So then we had to make the decision of, okay, since our strategic direction already has a lot of these components, do we want to just add them to our strategic direction or do we want to solely focus on a separate deliverable? And for us, we took it more, the EDI strategic, which is um, Bill 5194, we took that as a deliverable of our strategic plan. And that's because in working through, through that, we already know that that was gonna be an outcome and something that we were gonna be working on, the, uh, on in the near future. So we decided to um, do it separately instead of do a combination of it. Um, <clears throat> once that wasn't, once we developed that work plan and saw what all those components were, we came up with a very rough draft of what our plan is gonna be. So Ha explained uh, very clearly what 5194 was, what those elements were. So we know that that strategic plan has to include those four elements. And so for us, okay, we're gonna list, list these four elements, but what are gonna be our strategies and our activities that are gonna help us expand or do make this work actionable? So then we looked at fifth, uh, Bill 5227, and for us, those are the activities that are going to help inform some of the other, the elements or the components of 5194 that are within, you know, the guidance. Um, some of those, you know, conducting the campus climate assessments, it's like Hal mentioned. Now, we, ha we have to publish uh, results by hopefully the end of June, July 1st, if we're able to. So for us, um, we have this draft. It's very rough draft. Um, I'd love to share with you guys, maybe at a different information session, just because I don't, we're still, you know, doing work on how we're going to do that. But, um, and then if you want to move on to the next slide, Christina. And then, so currently what we're doing is we're at that point of conducting your campus climate assessment. Um, we had those discussions about which, um, a, which um, tool we were going to use. Was it going to be PACE because the college has been using PACE in the past or was it going to be HEADS or what other or, um, um, <clears throat> toolkit were we going to be using? Our college decided to go with Hanover. Um, the reason we ended up going with Hanover is after doing very, having various conversations with people on campus, you said, you know, we want to be very transparent in what we're doing and Myself, you know, Ilda or Steve or whoever, we want to keep, our administration wants to keep hands off, off this work. So we decided to go with an outside um, constituent to do that. They're going to help us do the survey, which that's already in the process. Um, we'll get uh, the data, that data is going to get analyzed. We'll conduct focus groups. And we've already put a work plan together that's hopefully going to give us our recommendations prior, hopefully by, um, May, which then once we get those recommendations, that's going to help inform our EDI strategic plan to make it final or finalize that. Once we have an opportunity to finalize those recommendations, we already have, and so all these bullet points that you see here, they're almost um, working, um, we're doing all these things at the same time, really, because we, thanks to the, ED, uh, the equity teams that we've had in the past, a lot of this work is already done. So once we look at these recommendations, maybe we'll go back to our teams, shuffle some things around if we have to. But um, these campus-wide EDI work groups are really who is going to help us lead the work and implement, you know, the recommendations and make them actionable. And that really then takes us back to developing and aligning the EDI and strategic plan. Again, this is where the work becomes actionable. It's not just saying, "Hey, this is our strategic." EDI plan and this is our strategic plan. So now we're gonna go good on what we're saying that we're gonna do. And so we're gonna do that by what we call creating a logic model. Um, a logic model is gonna is really a graphic illustration or a roadmap of our inputs, our resources, what the objectives are gonna be, what our outcomes are gonna be. And again, these work groups or what we call EDI work groups are gonna help us lead this work. <clears throat> You know, myself, um, Ilda, we're really just the facilitators. Again, the, you know, the whole campus as, as a whole has the accountability and responsibility be, to be doing this work. And so that's our plan on how we're going to get move forward with that. Um, I will say that, you know, from the beginning, it's 
it's been proving to be challenging, right? I think for everybody, 5227 and 5194, it's, hey, this is all new information. What are the other colleges doing? How are we going to move forward? How do we organize? And so what I would say is definitely get with your leadership, talk it through, um, you know, reach out to other people on campus because you're going to find that there's people that are, you know, more than highly capable to be helping leading this work who is who are committed and who are interested in moving this work forward. And so for us, I have to be very grateful because I have seen that at YVC and me being very new to leading some of this work, I have been able to reach out and get guidance and help and assistance in every way possible to make sure that we are not only meeting these requirements, because for us, it's not just checking a box. It shouldn't be transactional. It should, everything we're doing, it's, it's intentional in what we're hoping to do and hoping to accomplish and make some, you know, true change or transformational change at YBC. And again, <clears throat> that's already been in the works, I think, for the last few years with our equity teams on campus. Now it's just a matter of kind of putting everything together that everybody is doing and then um, moving forward. And then if you want to, um, there we go. And then finally, our work groups will hold uh, campus-wide report out, <clears throat> report out info sessions and collect feedback. So, you know, normally you'll see, you know, I don't know, if you're assigned to an area, you'll report out kind of what your progress is. For us, our plan is to have these EDI work groups report out within the areas that they're working on, whether that's on the campus climate assessment, whether that's on the faculty diverse work group and or that's on the mentoring strategies or outreach or you know the equity language team and so again that will hopefully once we get to this piece then we'll get that information you know pieced out i also want to say that you know with our co-leads and once in our work groups once we have that established you know we've talked about are we meeting once a week are we meeting monthly or how soon are we going to meet you know meet but once you know for right now Sounds like we're going to meet, uh, co-leads will meet once a month, and then we'll report out to executive leadership once a quarter. And, you know, come April, we hope, um, come May, we hope to have our final draft turned over to the state board to give us enough time to get feedback, to get that implemented and published on our website. Um, and we we're working, you know, with Hanover very closely to make sure a campus climate assessment is on, you know, is on target within those timelines. And um, our first work group, we actually meet with the campus climate assessment work group at the beginning of next week. <clears throat> and that's going to be the, I think I said that, the campus climate assessment work group, which is a diverse work group, it does include faculty, classified, um, administrative, and it also includes students. Um, you booked a sunny Verbo ski chalet with <laughs> endless views of snow covered. Um, so we'll be meeting with them early next week. Um, we were very excited that once we put the word out, students absolutely came forward and were very interested in working. And so we've had um, three students that came forward. Um, we reached out to student government, Laura Yolo, our student coordinator, you know, reached out to student government and put the word out. So two of those students are gonna be um, working with us. One of the students, um, part of that group, um, she actually was, on the college coalition team that helped put these bills forward at the legislative at, at the legislator um, and help them get them enacted and so she'll be on that team as well so <clears throat> it looks like the interest is out there and so we're very thankful and so that's all i have to share for today i don't know if you have any questions but that's that's our spiel or kind of our thought process and next steps of where we're at That's great, Jeanette. Thank you so much for that and holding, uh, reminding me and holding us to, to task on the offer to uh, colleges that if you are or would like to submit your EDI team for uh, just a, a peek and review and any kind of uh, feedback on that prior to final submission, feel free to do so. We, we opened up for that to occur starting January. So thank you for that reminder, <laughs> Jeanette, and holding us to, that, to task on that. Uh, so again, um, Jeanette also mentioned that she had uh, actively reached into our team as well uh, to just dial in teams coming together 
and doing that work and talking through that with your exec level leadership. So we're more than willing to do that as well, as well as one-on-one -on -one calls just to dive into each of these uh, deliverables within each of these bills. So feel free to do that. I appreciated that conversation with Jeanette and also being able to see where Yakima was in their work in this way. So uh, it was a really nice uh, conversation. Uh, I have a really quick question. It's Cheryl. Sure. Quick question. Hi, Jeanette. Um, the question is, so your, um, what is this uh, climate survey assessment team that includes the two students going to be doing when they begin meeting next week? Yeah, so um, their role is going to be, so like I mentioned, you know, myself and Elder are co-leads on this work. So really our job is really more to facilitate leading this work. And if you look at the activities at 5227, you know, they're asking conduct these surveys, hold information sessions. And so really what these, this team is going to be doing is helping, it's going to be working closely with Hanover to review the questions that are going to be being asked, um, making sure that the survey is being distributed, um, reaching out to the students to try and capture as big audience as we can to make sure that um, you know, people are answering that survey. Then um, working with Hanover to look over that data. Then once that data and recommendations are put into, uh, once that data is get back, you know, gets back, is helping also um, inform and organize the focus groups. Because sure, Hanover is doing a lot of the work, on the back end, but YVC still has the responsibility to distribute the survey, hopefully get respondents, organize the focus groups, you know, get the word out and so forth. So, and, and really just making sure and attesting, hey, the transparency is there, administration is standing back and really this is everybody else's, you know, this is, this is the, um, the college's responsibility as a whole. Thank you. That's great, Jeanette. Since we've got you, are there any other questions for Jeanette? No? Okay, I think we will uh, start on the next college showcase, and that is coming from Cascadia College in regards to their professional development uh, on anti-racism and equity, diversity, and inclusion. So welcome Sherry Davenport and Samantha Brown. Thank you so much. Sherry, can I pass it to you for opening words before we get on with the slides? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sam. What we're presenting today is um, a look at a course that uh, really Samantha uh, designed <laughs> with uh, input from other uh, faculty uh, and other folks around the college. Uh, I was um, uh, primarily the editor here. Uh, but so Sam organized and got this together. Um, however, we've been working with this with our uh, Cascadia community, community. It's extremely popular. And I was so um, impressed with the work that was done here that I wanted to share with SBTC to see if there were other colleges who might take, uh, who might not take advantage, but might have an opportunity to benefit from this uh, amazing work that's been done. So uh, I will turn it over to Sam, but I, I do have to say um, thank you for all the work that you did putting this together. Oh, thank you, Sherry. It's only because of you that this could be possible. So <laughs> Sherry will always give me more credit than she gives herself, and I will always give her more credit than I give myself. So then we end up going back and forth in a little uh, thing about who should thank each other more. So I thank you, Care uh, Sherry, for always being a collaborator and very trusted partner in all things. So I will be sharing um, some slides and then passing the torch to Sherry many times. Sherry is a incredible and talented weaver of information. So I often share a few slides and pass it to Sherry to weave some things together. So just so you know, that will be the flow. There'll be seven slides. I am monitoring the questions on the document that was put in the chat. And just for my own ease, I, I highlighted a portion in yellow that hopefully you can put the questions under just to make sure that I can notice them quickly as you're asking. So I'll keep an eye on that. And the slides will include information about the Foundations of Equity and Inclusion course a tour of the course, I'll be doing a screen share and then a testimonial from an alumni of the course. So thank you, whoever is doing the slides, look at you, you just knew right where we were heading into next. And so 
Um, this course is for people who are interested in going beyond compliance. This isn't quite going to be the best match for people who only want to check the box to meet the mandate. More on that to come, but just keep in mind as you're engaging with the presentation, this is definitely for people who want to go far beyond compliance. Next slide, please. Thank you. Our why for this course is that, of course, this is crucial work to be undertaking. And this kind of professional development is needed to create a workplace that lives up to its values, to create inclusive practices. And our most important why is that this is the work needed to do less harm to marginalized groups and to support those around us. And so that fourth bullet point was the most important one in the creation of this course and the strongest motivation. And then we do hope that this helps to move the needle on equity and inclusion, not just at Cascadia, but in our communities and people's homes and in the communities that they engage with. Next slide, please. A bit of history. Um, Sherry and I created, even though she'll say me, I, <laughs> Sherry and I, Sherry is one of our founding associate faculty members at Cascadia. She's been with at Cascadia for 22 years, and she and I had many hallway run-ins. And one day I was like, I need to work with this person more. How can I find a way to work with Sherry more? And then thus, this was created and now we're on a team together. So the history of this course is that we created it in summer 2020 and our first study group was in November 2020. A little more on the difference between the course and the study group to come. So at Cascadia, we have certainly created this um, in a, in a handy way in preparation for this, this mandate, but we did not know at the time the mandate existed. So we're, we're excited that we have this in development already. And then this is really handy timing, as Sherry said, to be sharing outward. And there are a few reasons why this was created. One, it was at the request of people eager to learn and grow. So it wasn't just sort of me deciding, um, hey, I'm going to create something and I hope people want it. It was very much by the request of the community and following the agency and lead of people in our Cascadia community. And it was created for, for a couple of reasons along with that request. One, people who want to learn and grow with very sincere interest in learning more about equity and inclusion. And also at the request of those with e and I experience who wanted to refer people somewhere for resources. We were getting ourselves in situations where we would be in all staff meetings, convocations, all employee learning, and somebody would ask, well, what does this word mean? And then meanwhile, half the group already knew, other people were brand new to knowing what, for example, BIPOC means. And so we wanted to be able to refer people somebody somewhere so we weren't taking up so much time in all group settings explaining um, what different terminology and concepts mean. And most importantly, this was created to take the labor and of education off of employees representing historically marginalized groups. So I heard one too many examples of employees carrying the burden of education and thought to myself, there's got to be a better way for individuals to learn and grow without putting that burden on their colleagues. So really proud that this could come into being and it's only through the support and advocacy and encouragement of the community that this came into being. Next slide, please. The outcomes of the course and the study group. So this is where we have a little two different elements. There is a way to complete the course via Canvas as independent study. What Sherry and I do want to give more attention to is how can we build in accountability into the independent study? So we're currently thinking through that. So for the sake of this, I'm going to talk about the course and the study group, keeping in mind we are trying to build in an accountability component for people who don't do the study group. So the course itself, as somebody's engaging with it, they will be learning foundational e and i concepts and gaining a deeper dive into new areas. So we went into this knowing that we want everybody at Cascadia to have sort of a similar foundation on which they are going about their work. And of course, somebody could be uh, quite proficient in one area, for example, ability, but gender and sexuality is new to them. And so when you receive a tour of the course, there's ways that for some of you, you might go, oh, wow, I know that module really well. Oh, this one would be newer to me. So I think there's ways for everybody to learn and grow. People will get more knowledge and they'll be prepared to engage more with their community and develop a personal call to action. People in the study group will also bring dedicated focus to modules. So Sherry and I facilitate the focus groups. It is a joy and a, a light in my work life. I just love these study groups. And so we get time for reflection, sharing insights, asking questions. And Sherry and I very much go into this with support and encouragement. We are not there to 
um, reprimand anybody for saying something quote unquote wrong. We want everybody to uplift each other, to learn and grow together and to engage in a supportive kind of way because we feel that is what moves the needle on E&I best when people feel encouraged and uplifted and supported to do it together. We also share ideas for ongoing learning and development. And I'm going to touch on the Beyond the Foundation sessions a little bit later, but people do receive an invitation for continued education after they complete the course. Next slide, please. Great, the target audience. And then after this, I will be giving a pause for Sherry to share before moving on to a demo of the course. Our target audience is a few. People who are new to ENI or who feel behind with certain topics. And so there may be individuals who say, I did not learn about equity and inclusion in school. There's so much I don't know. And then there's individuals who might share, wow, I seem to know a lot about say race and microaggressions, but gender and sexuality, that seems to be changing often. Every year there seems to be new understanding and I feel behind. And so we, we, get, we get both kinds of individuals. We attract individuals who consider themselves more advanced, but want to refresh their knowledge or access new information. We're constantly updating the course to keep it fresh and current. And there's people who enjoy self-paced learning in combination with the support of a group and accountability. So many of people will say, I, I want the group to one be with, to be in community and to hold myself accountable to completing the course. So, as I mentioned before, this is not the best match for people only seeking mandate compliance. It's a hefty course. And when I share the tour, I will respond to the question in the chat about how long is the course and, and what do the study groups look like? So I'll definitely touch on that. Thank you for making sure I do that in the question, whoever asked that one. So it's a hefty course. This is not a light ask of people. And so if people are just wanting to check a box, we don't recommend it, nor do I think it would really be the best match for them. It's for people, and it's not going to be for people who may need convincing that say institutional racism or institutional sexism is real. We're not there to, to debate people on what's real and not real. It's really to be with people who are sincere and willing and eager to go beyond compliance and be part of solutions. And we make that pretty clear in the marketing of the course. So we have had no issue as of yet with any kind of um, mismatch of expectations versus what people are getting. Sherry, would you be willing to share some more before I go into a tour of the course? Well, the just as you asked me, my email popped in. Uh, I'm ready for the tour. Yeah. Oh, right. So, yeah. I'm excited. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course, of course. You always have an opportunity on my book. <laughs> so the course design, this will answer a little bit of the question in the Google document. The course is 10 modules, which I will provide the tour of in just a moment. The, the pages within the modules they're about the length of a blog, so about 800 words. I, I aimed not to go over 800 words on any of them. And so they're substantial enough to provide information, but bite-sized enough to not overwhelm people. And each blog post, you might say, includes video content, links to additional learning. And so there's ways individuals might move through the course and only watch the videos and then revisit it later and click on more links and citations. So it, it's kind of choose your own adventure in some way with how much people choose to do at one time. And as long as people are with Cascadia, they have lifetime access to the course. And once we open this to all of SBCTCs, we'll, same applies. As long as you're in the system, you have access to the course throughout your duration in the system. Each page takes about 30 to 60 minutes to complete. And there's 36 pages. So now you get the sense that, okay, this is not, this is not a light lift. It is meant to be completed in pieces and not rush through. And Sherry and I give a lot of coaching to people on please don't rush through, take the time to digest, take the time to process um, and take the time for self-care as well. So um, next slide, please. And this should be the one where, yes, the study group design and then the tour, the tour of the course. So the course is 10 modules, not, not every module has a study group for it. And when I show you the course, that will be a little more evident as to why. Each study group is one hour, and then Sherry and I hold space for an additional 30 minutes. So it's one hour, we give people a graceful exit, and then for 30 more minutes, if they want to engage with us, if they have kind of questions they wanna keep asking, some people prefer sharing, sharing in a smaller group, it's a nice way to keep the conversation going. 
And the design of the group is very much community connection. All voices get heard. We make space for everybody. We, we really make sure that there's not two people dominating the conversation. So we facilitate that part well. And we, we focus the study groups on module reflection, supportive discussion. It's not a quiz. Nobody's tested. It's not giving a poll of who did what. It's, it's to keep the conversation happening. And at the end of every study group, people come away with a call to action. And this is via Canvas. So it's my understanding that um, it will, there will be ease of access for people across the system due to that Canvas component. And I'm going to um, you get a screen share the course. How long is the course? I'm just looking at the questions. Is there a cap on class size? Yes. So in terms of the study group size, Sherry and I find our kind of sweet spot about 12 to 15 people. <laughs> and so this is meant to be small group design. We'll be opening this up to the system for cohorts of about kind of 17, recognizing that people may um, have a change of plans a couple of days before and need to move to a different course or, or whatnot. And so we are aiming for about 15 people per study group that ensures that every individual has a chance to be heard. All right, let's go on a tour. Um, I am going to share my screen. And I'll just pause for a moment if people need to move their boxes around. While I'm giving the course tour, I am not able to see that questions document, though I will pop back to it once I end the screen share. And I assure you, I will not be clicking on every single module. I'll be starting it looking like I'm clicking on every one. And but but please know this is not going to be a page by page tour, just a brief tour. So in module one, this is content that we request people access before deciding if they want to engage in the course. It goes more in depth about what to expect, how to engage with the course, tips for it, and, and helping people determine, is this right for me right now? And so this is sort of part of the marketing piece, you might say, that when this is open for registration, we would have a lot of content at the front to help people make a good decision for themselves about if and when is the right time to complete the course. Module two is the first one that is a study group. And then we go module by module. I'll click on list of definitions to give one example. And then when, when we get to module four, I'll share one more page as an example. So for example, in module two, we are focusing on a bit of community building, get to know you, hearing why people are choosing a study group. And then we share our list of definitions to have everybody at a similar foundation of the words we'll be using throughout the course. And so as you will notice, some content, a video, and I assure you every video is always going to be from the represented population. It's, it's always going to be people who represent the group that we are sharing about, speaking for themselves on behalf of themselves and their um, community, if that's, if that's the, uh, the appropriate um, based on their content. And so, inclusion intersectionality and of course we will we will always be aiming to use the people who created the terms um so in this case kimberly crenshaw we recognize that there's times when people co-opt terms or or use terms and they've gotten away from their original definition and original intent and so we're always aiming to get to the creators of various um, concepts and terms and so an example of what we're starting with and i recognize the scrolling might be a little a little speedy for someone. I apologize for that. And this gets us going off to a really good start with conversation. I'm gonna back it up. And for module three, I'm opening it, but I won't be clicking on any of the pages. This is an example of this is the by far <laughs> the most time-consuming module and the heftiest emotional load. So we we, we have it first to let people know if they make it through module three, they will make it through the rest of the course. This is the most emotionally um, draining one. We recognize for some people, they're doing some significant identity development, having um, generational trauma arise as they're engaging with the material. So we hold space for that. We address it and we're there for people. Module three, module four is on gender and sexuality. And the next page I'll be clicking on, this is um, one of the last ones I'll be, I'll be showing you as an example. Every page includes about 800 words and we have content. And this is a, an example of there's links to click on throughout. 
there's videos throughout. So we aim to make it engaging and the feedback we've received is that it's highly engaging, that people like the format and indeed a number of faculty members have changed how they go about instruction based on their engagement with this course, with this multimedia and with all videos being from the represented population. So we're pleased about that. And I'll click on ability. And I recognize I'm not reading each one out loud, though, when this is made more, um, when sort of registration is open, I'll make sure that there's a, a thorough list of what's covered under each module. Ability, we move on to microaggressions and apologies, which, which is one of our shorter modules that gives people a little bit of a break. We try and space it, recognize at some point people need a little pause and a breath. So microaggressions and apologies is one of my favorite modules. It's also a little shorter one for folks. And we move into structural and institutional oppression. And then Sherry's favorite module, module eight, with Sherry's favorite page being allyship and why you shouldn't call yourself an ally. That is when I listen to Sherry's wisdom and just love hearing what she has to say about allyship and why you shouldn't call yourself an ally. So people get quite engaged with module eight and by module eight, they're ready to say, what do I do? How can I help? And then they get a nice surprise about why you shouldn't call yourself an ally. So that, that's a pretty fun module to engage with. And then module eight and module nine are together in the study groups. It's the only time we combine modules because there's sort of this social justice, what comes next, personal call to action. And by module nine, um, we just have a little closeout of the course. And then I mentioned the Beyond the Foundation sessions. Then I will pause and hold space for a testimonial. Beyond the Foundations. We know there's a lot of topics the course doesn't cover. And we are quite intentional that if people say, add this to the course, we say, no, it is extensive enough. It is robust enough. And at some point, all courses need to come to a close and move on to the 201 instead of the 101. And so in our Beyond the Foundation sessions, there are optional opportunities every other month for people to keep learning about a topic. And we just pick it that month, decide what it's gonna be. And this is an example of topics that we know we want to discuss, but there's not space for in the course as it exists. And so we keep the conversation going. I'm going to stop the screen share and take a breath. And Sherry, anything you'd like to share before I introduce Dr. Carrie Lovett? I, I would, um, what has been, well, all of this course is helpful, right? It, all of it is just very helpful. But what I would share about um, some of the pieces that have come out of the course that maybe, uh, I don't know if Sam expected, uh, I, was del I was delightedly surprised. Um, we have folks all over campus, whether they're faculty or staff, everywhere, talking about e &I, talking about what's happening and talking about this course. So uh, we had a group um, last week say, you know, we wanna know who's in that other course so we can all continue to talk about it. But what's really nice is when folks have a question, for example, someone was not clear on allyship. So we were able to say, go into Canvas, take a look. There's an explanation there. There's a video. It'll walk you through. We had some conversations on cultural appropriation, what it is, what it isn't, what's cultural appreciation. And so it's so nice to say, let's talk about it, but then let's direct you to this content because there's content in there. And some folks are a lot more comfortable going in and taking a look on their own before they can speak out more. But what I've noticed uh, since we've started the course is uh, there are folks who I would consider uh, generally sort of quiet, not talker type folks who are out there talking, let's, let's do this, let's do this. And they're feeling confident because they're going in and they're gathering that information that they're comfortable with, and then they're out having conversations. So we've had a lot of folks tell us that um, they really feel like they're ready to have conversations and they feel like they have the information. And, and the good thing, because of where it's located, if they don't, they know how to go and get it on their own. So as Sam mentioned, we have some faculty who are uh, swapping out content and pulling these pieces in. Right, so there's so much interaction with this. It's um, just really amazing. I know I sound like you know uh, an advertiser, but it really is. You know, it's it's doing so much with discussion um, all over our campus that I didn't actually I had hoped for, but didn't actually see coming. Now I'm so excited about it. You know that we're having all this conversation. So I was adding that. 
Oh, thank you, Sherry. I'll answer Parfait's question in the document, and then I'll introduce Dr. Kerry Levitt to share a testimonial, and then we'll hand it off to the next participant or the next presenter. So Parfait, thank you. When, when, I, when I had all my screens open, I didn't notice who was asking the question. So thank you for asking. Uh, Parfait asked, is the content of the course available to the entire SBCTC system? If yes, what is the process? Yes, we are going to make the course available to the entire SBCTC system, including the facilitated study groups. There Will be a fee for the courses which we, we just have to do <laughs> in order to open the course up to a number of people and sherry and i dedicate time to doing the study groups we, we will need to hire new staff in the office of equity and inclusion because otherwise we will we will max ourselves out with the study groups which i hope we max ourselves out with the study groups and so the registration we hope to open it in a few weeks we're just trying to sort out our internal registration system for for how to do that we're working with our um, it folks on that and the process will be let us know. You get access to the Canvas course. You'll get invitations to study groups. We have dates we're finalizing, so more to come. And thank you to Ha and Melissa and Christine at SBCTC because they have offered generously to help us market the course and put it on their website so people know about it. So much more to come on that. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Carrie Levitt, who is Cascadia's Vice President for Student Learning and Success and a course alumni. So take it away, Carrie. Thank you so much for your willingness to share a testimonial. Thank you, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie, and I also identify as a member of the LGBTQAI plus community, and also those in accessibility, um, having invisible disabilities. Um, uh, and I want to speak to this on, in two levels. One is as an executive participating in the course, and the other is just as a participant. Um, and before I um, enrolled in the course, if you can call it enroll, um, Samantha and I had some pretty deep conversations about the impact of one of the executive officers participating in any given cohort um, because of the inherent power and privilege that comes with being a vice president. Um, and fortunately at Cascadia, we are not overly hierarchical um, and we have a relatively small community. Um, and I have a background of teaching diversity um, um, as well and um, there was um, a sense that, you know, there's, let's, let's see how it will go. Um, but because of the openness of how Sherry and Samantha crafts the cohorts and the expectation within each group, we, um, we thought it would be just fine. Um, and as a participant, um, it was just fine. Um, and I'm really grateful I had the opportunity to participate um, because I oftentimes don't have the opportunity to be um, very vulnerable and authentic in a lot of places because I'm a decision maker. Um, and um, this was a great opportunity, again, for me to especially be vulnerable with um, my colleagues across um, Cascadia. And um, I mean, honestly, the, the module on um, disability and accessibility and um, gender were the hardest for me um, because those are my communities um, and um, uh, I received a great response from folks that I don't usually get to interact in those times and I made the choice to also be very vulnerable about my experience and how I felt and how I was impacted in my life um, and so that was just a great opportunity to to take down some of the um, somewhat artificial barriers that are in place because of systematic oppression and marginalization of folks within positional um, power, uh, positions with power, to put it that way. Um, and I also want to affirm that what they say about um, the workload to really engage in this course is true. And I did the full course, not the study group. Um, it takes hours to get through each module and to really be prepared for the discussions. And the content in and of itself was incredible um, and easy to navigate. The power came in the conversations that we had each month on each of the each of the modules, um, and that is where each person um, had the opportunity not just to share but also to ask questions from inquiry to really deepen understanding. Um, and sometimes 
that required responses from Sherry and Samantha as the facilitators, but because it was a pretty diverse cohort, um, the participants get to be the experts as well, um, not just on their own lived experience, but their community's experiences and what happens at Cascadia. Um, I know our associate faculty who participated and faculty and staff who participated in, in my cohort in a very different and familiar way than anybody else in our community. Um, and so as you think about this course in, in your own um, college communities, think about how to integrate the, your deans and directors and your um, executives into um, faculty and staff cohorts because there is a lot of power, but also with caution, making sure that you've got, going back to what Samantha and um, said, that willingness to be authentic, vulnerable, and authentic just really an engage from a position of inquiry as opposed to having to be a vice president um, because if you come in at, as a vice president your experience is going to be less than what it could be and may also have an impact on the other participants it was an incredible experience and i hope all of you um, advocate that you use this with your colleges take it yourself um, it's just phenomenal i even used this stuff with my 12 year old and 10 year old um, and as advanced as it was they understood the constructs and the videos and as a parent raising two white um, boys who were going to grow up to be white men it really helped me unpack some of the issues that were going on um, uh, a year ago and um, helped me have some difficult conversations with them so that they grow up to use their power and privilege to make things better for others Thank you. I wasn't expecting all that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was blushing over here. Thank you all for just, you know, your, your, your attention. So appreciate it, Sherry. And I hope we have the chance to connect with you as the course gets launched statewide. So back to you, Ha. Huh? Thank you so much for the time. What a beautiful ad there at the end, inviting Carrie in to, to uh, give testament to the impact this course has had on her work professionally and um, also on a personal level. So thank you, uh, Carrie, for joining us and uh, props to Sam and Sherry uh, all day long, uh, you know, to, to be able to provide this as an option at a system level, uh, the depth and the content of the material that you've developed. I know colleges are going to be looking at options to be able to scale this type of work across their campuses. And so this is a nice option for colleges to consider. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to point out before we move on to uh, esteemed Parfait Basley from South Puget Sound Community College uh, is that the unique relationship that Sam and Sherry share on their campus, and that is, um, and I hope I'm not uh, misunderstanding or miscommunicating this, uh, Sam, and uh, that you used to reside in the HR uh, area of your campus and, and now have fully um, staffed yourself within Sherry's department. But with that comes a set of, a certain set of knowledge and experience uh, in regards to how this coursework could be integrated into, uh, let's say, a developing faculty diversity program where you utilize portions of those modules for staff onboarding. Um, Correct. As, Good memory. As staff huh? hired in. Yeah. No. I just. I. I. I just think it's such an incredible collaborative effort, and I want to showcase that because I think it's something to be thinking about as both of those inform each other. Uh, so if you, uh, if there's colleges out there that are thinking about how to do that, that's that's one avenue, one strategy that Cascadia has used that I think is uh, a really critical one. So with that, uh, with no further ado, our closer, Parfait Basilei. Uh, for uh, Outreach Communities of Color and Peer Mentoring Strategies. I appreciate this, especially too in thinking about, and I'm glad to see uh, Monica Wilson, I think she may still be in the Zoom, I don't know if she is or not, uh, here today with us, because we want also for colleges to uh, be thinking about how these strategies are embedded within their guided uh, pathways initiative and work. Um, and this is one that uh, clearly points to uh, the guided pathways framework in regards to uh, meeting these outcomes and supporting students of color and low income populations. So with that, uh, Parfait, I'm gonna give it to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Paula. Um, thank you to, uh, for everybody for being here and uh, for the former uh, um, previous presenters, I want 
Shout out to Jeanette. Thank you for going to the presentation in spite of the challenge with your, your health and, and for uh, Sherry, Sam and Carrie for your previous um, very informative um, presentation. Really grateful for all that information. So quickly with the time that we have on hand, I wanna be mindful of people's time. Um, I was asked to share a little bit about the work that we're doing at South Pakistan Community College uh, related to outreach to communities of color and peer mentoring. Um, so as I was previously introduced, my name is Parfait Bastille. I am the Executive Diversity Officer here at South Puget Sound Community College. Um, and so I will get started with uh, the peer mentoring strategies. Obviously these two, um, two items on the screen that you're seeing, they're, uh, they're interwoven, they work with each other. And I'll get to unpack that in a little bit, but let me start with the peer mentoring strategies. Um, so some of you might already have um, a federally funded program uh, named uh, TRIO, or you may have heard of that. Um, so the, the two programs I'm about to talk about were heavily inspired by the federally funded TRIO model. Um, our college was not eligible for the grant, um, but the commitment to uh, supporting uh, uh, students and communities of color uh, was still there. So we, we decided to figure out, okay, how do we make it happen, even though the funding is not there? Um, so if I can get the next slide. Um, so I, I like to, every time I get to talk about this program that I'm really proud of um, because of the institutional commitment that's going to uh, standing them up and continually supporting them. I like to ground the presentation, uh, the, the principles, the guiding principles that have helped us not only stand them up, but also help us uh, continually revising them and refining them as we move forward. Uh, so our guiding principles at the college around equity are three statements. As you can see them on the screen, first one is to center the people we serve and try to meet them where they are. Um, or where they are. Um, the second statement is to continually identify barriers to academic and professional success and a, um, a stance uh, of commitment to try to remove those barriers whenever we identify them. And lastly, but not least, uh, the notion of when trying to find solutions, we want to involve those most impacted when trying to find solutions. And so um, that's something we try to <laughs> uh, stand by as we, we continue to work on these programs um, the, uh, that we have named and the Black Scholars and the Ignite program. Next slide, please. Um, so a, a high level overview of those programs. Um, the first one that, uh, that was first stood up was the Ignite program. As you can see on the screen, the crit criteria for being part of the program are essentially for students who are either low income or they identify as students of color or they have a documented disability with our institution or um, they are first generation. So none of their parents uh, did uh, complete a, a degree of uh, in higher ed. And so if any of those criteria are, are true, then they're automatically eligible for the program. And so what we did was um, about four years or so ago. So the Ignite program is in its fourth year. And when we stood it up, uh, I was at that time, the director of the multicultural center at the college. And it was an institution wide um, initiative in, in getting some partnership, obviously with the foundation because we didn't have federal funding for, for the program. So we worked really closely with the foundation to identify sponsors and donors in the community to, to help fund this. Um, and so we started with this broader umbrella program, if you will, because there were students of color, there were white identifying students, but they, they fit also other criteria, as you can see on the screen. Um, but then by the third year into the program, and we continue uh, continued monitoring the data, looking at the data of completions um, in our college, it was pretty clear that uh, Black students, Black and African-American students were the students that we were not serving uh, as well. And so based on that data, we went into a phase number two, which was to have a targeted um, program called Black Scholars Program that was built on the model of Ignite, but with a focus on Black and African-American students. Um, so that's the timeline of how those programs came to be. Um, and so the Black Scholars Program is in its second academic year now. We stood it up last year and we're going on to the second year now. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so concretely, what do students get? Um, this is what we advertise, and this is how the programming is done in the, pro, uh, in, in the programs. They get a sense of community. Um, they get a dedicated educational planner that work really intrusively with them, um, with a well-scripted, thoughtful, thought out um, case load management schedule and calendar uh, with strategic touch points during the quarter that align with the academic calendar and some uh, just critical uh, dates around, um, you know, like registration, for instance, um, around add and drop classes, dates and, and so forth. They also get paired up with a peer mentor, which is a critical piece here, because it's one thing to get the support from an administrative staff, but it's another thing to have a peer who's going to college or has been to college. Um, and then they also get additional resources along the lines of laptops, um, textbooks every quarter that they return um, in order to get you know, the next round of, of books for the next class, set of classes. Um, they are also eligible alongside some um, some special populations for early registration. And, and it was something that we felt very strongly about when we were working with our enrollment uh, services at the college that we didn't want um, a student to be held back um, because they couldn't get into a class uh, because they didn't register in time. So we were able to get that early registration uh, feature as part of uh, something that the students get. And then you can see on the screen a lot of life and academic skills um, uh, development through um, not only the coaching that happens uh, organically with them working with our ed planners, but also through some, some of the intentional programming that we do um, in our uh, community forums. We bring experts uh, from the community to tackle topics ranging from financial literacy to you know, resilience and overcoming hardship. Um, and, and also from local experts within our college itself. So folks from the, the writing center, uh, standing up some workshops around how to write, um, you know, compelling um, personal statement letters for scholarship applications and the list goes on. Uh, one of the elements that is distinct for the Black Scholars Program um, compared, compared to the IGNITE Program was the fact that we, we because it was a smaller uh, cohort to begin with, and we wanted to leverage the data uh, that came from the SBCTC system telling us that when students complete 45, so the SAI indicators, right? So when a student completes 45 credits um, in, in their academic journey, their, their uh, likelihood or probability of completion goes through the roof. Um, and so based on that data point, we, we decided, okay, how can we create an incentive system in partnership with our foundation to, to offer a $500 scholarship for students who, while within the program, they're able to complete those 45 credits. And so um, that's, that's something that we've been able to stand up and it's still standing with, and it was really interesting to see how the community came along that, that model, especially local donors, um, because there's just a lot of uh, enthusiasm around supporting um, you know, um, equity work. And so um, that's something that we will, our intention at this point is if we, if it's proved itself to be successful, uh, we want to be able to increase the funding model in order to, to apply that to the Ignite program as well. So next slide, please. And Christina, you're doing great. <laughs> I want to highlight that the next um, piece here on the screen is the application deadline. I, I thought it wasn't, I don't want to get into all the minutiae with all the aspects of the program. I'll be happy to connect with anybody who wants to get the blueprint of the program and things like that. Very happy to share. But one uh, element that I really want to highlight here is our application process. Uh, just like most systems that we built in higher ed or any other institution, the tendency right, is to go through what has always been done or the way we know <laughs> things are done. right? And so when we had first stood up the Ignite program, our application model was was such that you know you have your traditional deadline um, and then um, you know a turnaround time when we we provide them with information on how to get into the program and then there was an onboarding and the list goes on very sequential process um, but then when the pandemic um, right <laughs> there are some positive from the pandemic <laughs> uh, when the pandemic hit we were forced to to go remote um, and it really forced us to innovate and rethink the ways in which we were doing our application. And we realized that 
um, and concurrent to all the feedback that we got from students um, that we were uh, essentially prioritizing type A type students, right? Who were on top of things that were able to submit the application by a certain uh, deadline. And so what we ended up doing at that point is to totally next that, that process and to, to move on, to, uh, move to a more continuous enrollment model where at any given time, when a student hears about the program, they can join. And you know what we, we found through that change is that um, it was causing less of an adverse emotional impact on students who found out about the program, but then essentially our message to them was us oh, too bad, too late, <laughs> right? So now they could join the program at any given time because we are facilitating the onboarding through technology. And so it's more self-paced um, and then we're still able to get them in at any given time. Um, and that was an example, again, of centering the student need rather than the institution and our own processes and what was convenient. Uh, next slide. I feel like I'm racing with myself. <laughs> so I think, you know, all that is said and done. Um, let me maybe expand a little bit about the peer mentoring because that's one of the main things. So the students are, you know, they're paid, their staff uh, from our, um, our diversity center. They uh, have a caseload, if you will. Uh, and it's a ratio of one mentor to about 12 mentees. There's a, uh, a caseload management plan that they have essentially checking in with each student, uh, which with their case, yeah, with their portfolio every two weeks. Um, and there are a set of questions, um, to uh, discussion topics that they get coached on uh, and having those conversations with their students to ensure that issues don't sneak up on, on us as a team. Uh, we wanna be in front of it and building that relationship between mentors and mentees allows to unearth any issues that might become problems later so that they're not crisis, but rather things that we can manage, uh, whether they're fiscal or related to housing or academic challenges. Um, so I, I thought I would share some of the program outcomes and start with qualitative data, um, you know, it's just amazing every time I get, we get some of the feedback from students. Sometimes it's very informal through random emails that they send. Sometimes it's during the community forums that we, we host. Um, but this is um, some of the, the thoughts and comments the students have with regards to how they've been experiencing the program. It really feels like a sense of family and people having their back and having a touch point on campus in order to navigate challenges that occur, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's related to the, the various resources that um, our system has to offer and them having a hard time knowing what, where they're at uh, or how to access those. Uh, now, let me get a little bit more quantitative and I'm looking at the clock. I know we are at the, um, at the three o'clock mark, uh, but probably for the next few minutes, I'll try to kind of cruise through this and, and be open to, to questions for those who are willing to linger. So the next slide will dive into more quantitative um, outcomes for the uh, of the program. Um, yes, let's go ahead. Here we go. So some of the equity um, measures that we have in our strategic plan at the college um, are essentially um, around. Some of them are around the SAI indicators, uh, student achievement indicators, but some of them are also along the lines of looking at first quarter retention rates. And we do a lot of disaggregation of data um, because they are obviously, those are indicators of whether a student is going to persist. And so when you look at the data here, you can see um, for our Ignite students, so students who fill, fit the profile that I've described earlier, low income first generation, um, um, students with disability or students of color, they have a 80% retention rate for their first quarter compared to non-Ignite students who fit the same profile. And you can look on the other side of the screen for Black scholars versus non-Black scholars. We have about a 10% um, difference there. So the program is, is, is helping. I mean, we're still looking at a small end for the Black scholars. It's just been one year of data, uh, but it's promising in terms of um, its, its promises. Next slide, we will be looking at more fall to fall retention, which is also another right indicator. If you, you we're able to maintain students on campus for about a year, right? Um, this is what the data is looking like so far. On the Ignite side, it's about three year worth of data. Um, so students in the Ignite program have about a 71% uh, return rate from fall to fall. And uh, non Ignite students uh, feeding the, again, the same profile at 37%. And for the black scholars, um, there's a there's a marginal um, um, 
larger return rates for the black scholars versus non-black scholars. But again, we're just looking at a one-year data so far. Um, next slide. Um, this one, the slide is a little, um, there's a lot of information in there, but I, I had already alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it's it's the those SAI milestones. So 15 credits um, and then 45 credits. Uh, all those are very critical indicators um, and they're telling whether students is likely to persist to completion. And you can see for all students, independent of their profile or, uh, or not, we are as an, an institution at 28% for the uh, first 15 credits. Uh, for our Black scholars, um, 64%. Um, and then for our non-Black scholars, 47%. And for the Ignite, you can see, um, no, did I just put the wrong, yeah, I put Blacks, no. So this is black scholars. So the top is a 15, uh, the first SAI 15, 15 points. And then at the bottom is the 45 um, um, credits, college credits, SAI points. And you can see again for, for black scholars compared to all general students, 48, um, black scholars 50 and non-black scholars 56. Um, I think the next slide is for Ignite. Um, no, I don't have that. So, um, but it's a similar trend as well. The, the our Ignite students have a higher rate of um, um, completion of those those milestones. Um, so with that, that's kind of a, that was the in-depth uh, analysis of how the programs are doing. Uh, so that that peer mentoring, that wraparound model is really supporting our students. Uh, so the next step really to this, which aligns with the, the demands, if you will, of the, the legislative bill, um, which requires the um, you know, the hiring, if you will, of an outreach specialist who will work with um, the local high schools in order to help with the pipeline of historically underrepresented students uh, going through college. Uh, so one of the ways our, our institution is looking at implementing this is by hiring an outreach specialist who will be located um, in the student services area of our institution with a dotted line to, to my office. And there was a lot of back and forth in terms of what made sense organizationally for, the, for this individual, for them to be successful. And the decision was made to really focus on what will help them be successful, right? It was, and the fact that the outreach office has already, uh, is chest deep in this work, have been doing a lot of work around outreach already, that this individual will be better served having a direct report to the directors of um, outreach, but then really being connected to our center um, for being aware and looking into uh, critical initiatives, opportunities um, for the students that they will be trying to outreach to. Um, and the, in, the intentionality in the job description um, is that this particular outreach specialist will have um, on-site um, days where they will be in the local high schools, um, working there with FAFSA applications, giving presentations about college opportunities, about the Black Scholars and the Ignite program um, in order to help, um, you know, draw students to those programs and knowing what is available in terms of support. Uh, and this individual as well will be working with our strategic um, community partners, um, communities of color, uh, in helping with putting events um, together that um, promote college or um, just just build that that sense of community and our engagement in the broader community as a as a community college. So that was the fast download of the information. I appreciate you all uh, hanging in there with me with that. Um, I was not monitoring the questions. It doesn't seem like there was anything that came through, but um, as you digest this information and there's more questions that come up, feel free to email me um, and I will be happy to connect with you all. That was beautiful, Parfait. Thank you so much for being such a phenomenal closer. Uh, and thank you to everyone for staying on. I wanna especially thank South Puget because of their, uh, their strategy. They took uh, very student-centered. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Parfait talks about the work of the research office. I see Jennifer Tuya was able to join us today. I think she's the director there at South Puget Sound and the good work that they're doing to ensure that much of their programming um, uh, of these programs, the peer mentoring, as well as the uh, uh, outreach to communities of color is informed by data. Um, and then also against the context of our uh, SAI student achievement initiative um, focus. So really wanna call attention to that. 
Uh, I know that that might not be the case across the board, but I would encourage colleges to collaborate in the same fashion that uh, South Puget did in continuing to develop these programs from a, a data informed position and then working to evolve from that point as well. Um, so congratulations to South Puget for moving the needle, if you will, um, and helping to serve our students, our black students in that in that way. Uh, so just want to, again, thank everybody who was able to attend and, and stay on with us through this. Hopefully it was helpful to each and every one of you in some semblance. Um, hopefully uh, we can hear from you if you need us. We are here. Again, open door. We can meet with you personally one-on-one -on -one, with your full exec teams. Have a way that works to help advance uh, the work that you're trying to do in regards to these uh, legislative uh, bills. And with that, uh, again, thank you to the presenters as well for yeah. stepping into the fire with us and doing this work and then giving us the opportunity to showcase and highlight uh, your incredible efforts. Um, that's it, everybody. Uh, again, thanks, thanks, thanks. Reach out at any time. And if there's anything else anybody wants to throw in there, feel free, just unmute and do so. Great, I'm seeing a lot of goodbyes, people peeling off. Hi, I have a question. Yes, I can't quite see who that is. Me, Benny, yes. I'm wondering. Oh, oh Benny, hi. <laughs> I, I do have a question. One, thank you so much. This has been so informative and I'm very grateful for all the presenters. So I um, appreciate you providing this space. Um, I do have a question. I know it was mentioned earlier around the trainings and the faculty diversity programs um, around how we can, um, there may not be a uh, maybe comprehensive um, state, um, I guess, curriculum, um, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Um, one thing that um, in talking to some of our adjunct faculty, um, one of the things that came out, and then I'm new to community colleges, I've only been uh, here for three months, um, is a lot of times they talked about how most of the time they are teaching in different colleges. And if we implement a plan that may be unique to each institution, mm -hmm. would that mean that they, if they're, teach, if they're teaching in a um, like CBC and another community college, then mm. they would be taking two different types of DEI or be part of those trainings. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. was there something that um, we could um, maybe consider or think about in terms of some core themes that mm -hmm. allow us to make sure that we're in alignment specifically if our adjunct faculty who want to be a part of these but may not um, be able to take all of the whatever uh, what the expectations could look like for future whether it becomes like a mandatory training that they mm -hmm, have to be mm -hmm. a part of so i wanted to just maybe bring that up and see if other people have talked about it and what that could um entail yeah i know you point to um attention i know that your your deoc commission group has has discussed pretty richly, and that is the variability of the different DEI trainings across the system and the, con the depth of content and the breadth of that content and what it covers. Um, and the worry that colleges may choose to move towards a scalable, but also check the box uh, sort of option. And so we want to uh, ensure that the messaging around that, um, again, valuing that colleges have local decision-making of course, uh, but within our spheres of influence and the DEOC group is a powerful voice in that uh, to really uh, encourage colleges to consider a really rich developed uh, programming that is informed by a lot of the expertise of your group. So uh, I know some of the conversation in that group has been around um, a developmental framework model that uh, could be shared at a system level, we can help to showcase that as well and emphasize the importance of that. Um, so however way we can support 
um, that messaging and the 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 building of that, um, we're we're more than ha happy to do that. Um, I know that in the language of the bill, uh, adjunct tend to um, either work for uh, at several different colleges at different points in time, um, and so some of their uh, training that's required could be done at Columbia Basin, and then they are also over, or they leave and they move over to um, Pierce College, um, let's just say. Um, and there is a window period of time that of an adjunct, I believe, and I'll, I'll circle back again to verify that with you, Benny, and that is uh, adjuncts who have completed at one institution within a time frame will not then be required to do it at another. Uh, so it behooves us to um, as strong as we can with as much influence as we can to encourage uh, a depth of training such that it's as streamlined as we possibly can all the while recognizing that colleges have their own decision-making um, uh, control around that. I think your group's gonna be really powerful in moving that um, um, sentiment. Right, um, especially as we move it up the chains to uh, the president's ears and what that looks like. Um, I, I don't know if I answered fully your, your line of questioning, but um, I think I might've hit on your, sort of the crux of what you're referring to. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm, I appreciate that the intentionality of ensuring that um, it will work. Uh, I also, one of the things that came up in our discussions, which we will maybe address, like talk about in the DOC, is um, allowing for those because I'm so new. Uh, one of the things we talk about is when there's no opportunities for adjunct to be part of these trainings, mm. it also creates a lot of issues with like bias response teams and mm. being able to hear so much of the the microaggressions and challenges that students are faced with in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And part of that could be also with um, faculty wondering that they don't have access to those trainings or they haven't been well-versed in what that looks like for them in the classroom. <coughs> That's almost, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I appreciate what you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Great. I'm glad you were able to uh, be with us, Benny. 